So now we can finally move on to the terms of Maxwell's equations. And to begin with, we're gonna talk about electric field intensity, which for this purpose we can think of as voltage or force of the initial push that drives things. And electrical field intensity exists in vacuum. This is how we receive light through our windows and so on. And basically, this is the energy that is there. Secondly, we have polarization element. And we know that certain elements can store electrical energy as charge. And uh, capacitors, for example, are two electrical plates that are placed close to another, which can store energy in between. So when an electrical field is applied to a particular material, its electrons and protons begin to move in opposite directions and stretch to electrons orbit, which begins to create electrical field via this dipole. A material in which those dipoles are present is said to be electrically polarized. The electrical susceptibility is a measure of how easily the material can be polarized due to applied electrical field. So when this happens, and an electrical field applied from external sources creates an electrical field inside a material, a combination of this creates flux. And flux is measured with electrical flux density D. And this is the third parameter of Maxwell's equation. The electrical flux density D is most closely related to the concept of charge. So you can think about it that way. There is a very similar picture when we consider magnetic fields. Likewise, magnetic fields exist in the vacuum and they can be measured with magnetic field intensity H, which is the fourth term of Maxwell's equations. And it, like electrical field intensity, magnetic field intensity is the energy that is external to our observation. And likewise, magnetic energy can be stored inside materials. And this is referred to as magnetization of a particular element. And we know that from inductors and ferrites. The magnetic field intensity H is most closely related to the concept of electric current. And you can think of it as an initial push that torques the and or sparks the action. Just like the concept of capacitance, magnetization is also related to dipoles created within a material. Except in a magnet, dipoles tend to align or disalign. And when they align, the material has high magnetization, and when they disalign, the material has low magnetization. The measure of magnetic susceptibility is a measure of how well magnetic dipoles can align or disalign due to applied magnetic field. Finally, similarly to the concept of electric flux density, there exists magnetic flux density B. And B is a measure of external magnetic field with the magnetic field created within the dipoles of the particular magnetic element. Magnetic flux density is most closely related to the concept of force. You can think of it that way. Also, in terms of a compass. In a compass, the arrow will align with the direction of magnetic flux density. The next parameter of Maxwell's equations is the electric current density. And we can think of it as the energy that is flowing through a conductor. So if you imagine a coaxial cable or something similar like that, then the current flowing through it will be related to current density. So in other words, J is the electric current I distributed over the surface S. And at higher frequencies, you must also consider the skin effect, which means that the current distribution will be much higher on the outer surface than on the inner. In the Maxwell's equations, we will also see volume charge density, PV, which is a charge Q distributed over a volume V. And this becomes important when we consider point charges. So that's it for Maxwell's equations. But there are two more equations that are really important for describing the phenomena of electromagnetic waves, and those are the constitutive relations which bound those equations 
to the material world. And the first one is the permittivity, which is a measure of how well a medium can store electrical energy. And essentially we can think of it as of a capacitor. So a capacitor will have high permittivity and let's say rubber will have a very low permittivity because it's an insulator. So permittivity is measured as a multiplication of vacuum permittivity with relative permittivity, where vacuum permittivity is a constant and a dielectric permittivity tends to change with uh, any particular material. Likewise, permeability consists of relative permeability and vacuum permeability, whereas one is constant and the other is a dielectric constant which changes with materials. Finally, conductivity describes how well a material transfers electrical energy. And this is a typical measure for conductors such as copper and silver. And uh, when we say that silver can transform electrical energy faster, this is basically because of conductivity. As we define the terms of electric flux density and the magnetic flux density, we can see that those terms are really similar where the electric flux density is really a combination of vacuum response with polarization and uh, multiplied by electric permittivity. And similarly, magnetic flux density is a multiplication of magnetic permeability uh, with vacuum response plus magnetization inside the material. So having discussed the terms that compose Maxwell's equations, we can now move to Maxwell's equations themselves. So the first equation means that the divergence of electric flux density is equals to volume charge density. And what it means practically is that the amount of field lines leaving per volume is equal to the amount of charge inside this uh, material. On the other hand, the divergence of magnetic flux density equals to zero, which means that every magnetic field line must return to its source. And uh, it's exactly that. The magnetic field lines always terminate back on where they come from. So they create loops. Whereas electric field lines terminate on negative charges. They originate on positive charges and terminate on negative charges, which doesn't have to be in exactly the same spot. Finally, the third and fourth Maxwell's equations tell us how electric fields create magnetic field and how magnetic fields create electric fields. For instance, in the third law, the curl of electric field is nothing but a rate of change in magnetic flux density. And the curl of magnetic field is nothing but a rate of change in electric flux density plus J, which is the electric current density. And electric current density, as we discussed, is defined as a charge passing through a conductor per surface area. So those two equations are really the conclusion of Michael Faraday's experiments that we have discussed earlier. The last mathematical concept that we need to discuss here is the bayard salvat law. And the bayard salvat law allows us the calculation of magnetic flux density at a distance r for a given current. And it goes like this. It is permeability of free space multiplied by current multiplied by distance multiplied by length and divided by 4p r squared. Byatt and Salvat experimentally deduced this relationship that links current in a wire to an infinite small uh, magnetic flux density b r distance away from the wire, which means that magnetic fields are directly related to currents. And acceleration of charges is what launches radio signals. When E and B propagate together at the speed of light, they go essentially as one and they complement each other. And when we say that a particle is accelerating, what we really mean is that its velocity is changing. So why do antennas actually radiate? Let's now draw an antenna like this and consider adding electromotive force, EMF, to its base like this and we have now created a motion of particles so the electrons are moving in the antenna uh, as we know from negatively charged to positively charged protons and because it's made of copper we can allow a high conductivity factor so this now creates magnetic fields which are perpendicular to the antenna and electric fields which are 
parallel to the antenna. And as we just discussed, those are really a manifestation of the same phenomena and are closely related to each other. Then each electronic charge in the antenna experiences force equal QE and therefore it's equal MA where M is a mass of electron and A is acceleration. So that means that we have an alternating current in the antenna and this creates electric and magnetic fields accordingly. Within 10 wavelengths of the antenna we have what is called near field and after that we've got far field. And the difference between near field and the far field is that the near field is highly magnetic and E is always smaller than B for wavelengths less than 10 whereas for far field uh, E is equals C times B where C is the speed of light and this is how electromagnetic fields propagate in free space. To summarize, the magnitude of the resulted magnetic field depends on the velocity of charge and the amount of charge. This means that the magnetic field is just a relativistically transformed electric field. So the electric fields do not exist without magnetic fields and magnetic fields do not exist without electric fields. They must always change together and they do. Mutual recreation occurs perpetually with the velocity c and James Maxwell proved it, where E and B fields are basically mathematical concepts that describe essentially the same thing, which is an action at distance. So that's it for today's video. I hope you understand now a little bit better why do antennas radiate and how do electromagnetic waves create each other and propagate in free space. Hope you enjoy this video, please let me know what you think about it and I'll see you in the next one very soon. Also, I would like to pledge to you to please donate to Ukraine and give your support to Ukrainian refugees who are finding it extremely difficult to basically find shelter above their heads. And uh, this is absolutely heartbreaking. And um, I am strongly against the war. Uh, I condemn it in every possible way. So if you support this channel, please support uh, Ukrainian refugees and please donate to Ukraine. Thank you.